Welcome to Good Journeys with Second Mountain, the podcast that shines a spotlight on inspiring people and their inspired stories. Coming up on this episode, I had rearranged the world around me to be so routine based and so kind of set in its structures that I could cope with it, you know, in my, in my autistic way. Because autistic people crave that because, you know, we're so stressed all the time because everything's mm. so stressful, you know, the sensory sensitivity, the communication problems, the, the social anxiety and, and the difficulties in, in that, you know, it means that we're always at that kind of top end of what we can really cope with. So there's a tendency to, you know, slot into routines to reduce that stress. But of course, the moment you become a parent, all of that gone. You know, yeah. I, I, it, it just all evaporated, especially because um, uh, the child was quite a bad sleeper, you know, like a really unusually bad sleeper mm-hmm. and still is to an extent. It was difficult. You know, it, my routine evaporated. All of the kind of systems and things that I'd subconsciously put into place in order to cope vanished. Hello and welcome to the Good Journeys with Second Mountain podcast, shining a spotlight on inspiring people and their inspired stories. I'm your host, Ben Veal, founder of Second Mountain Comms, helping good people do good. And joining me today is my very special guest, Pete Warmby. Pete is a writer, speaker and autism advocate. Trained as an English teacher, he was diagnosed as autistic as an adult and is now focused on increasing awareness and understanding of the condition via multiple public platforms. Pete has spoken nationally about his experiences, including at the National Autistic Society's professional and mental health conferences. He's now also the author of two books, What I Want to Talk About, How Autistic Special Interests Shape a Life, and Untypical, How the World Isn't Built for Autistic People, and What We Should All Do About It. Pete is hugely passionate about making the world a more suitable and understanding place for the neurodivergent community, and I'm so pleased to have him as my guest on today's show. Pete, thanks so much for being with me on the podcast today. How are you? Uh, no problem at all. I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Very good today. Uh, how are you? I'm very well. I was I was first saying, before we started recording, I was saying how delighted I am to see the giant Daily Bugle and Titanic <laughs> and Ghostbusters Firehouse that adorn your, your home office. It's wonderful to see. And I'm quite <laughs> jealous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's this is very much my happy place. You know, it's... Um, it's it's where I do you know my writing my my talks my speeches my podcast interviews everything you know this is this is the the little zone that I inhabit it's like a it's like a happy little Lego filled bubble I love it uh, have you have you found that you've really kind of gravitated towards Lego in the last few years as a as something to to kind of get you in the zone and give you a bit of nice concentration yeah I, I have I mean it's interesting I, I was really into it as a kid you know as I talk about in the in what I want to talk about um you know really a big Lego fan in, like in the 90s um and then I entered what we Lego fans call the dark ages which is when you kind of go off Lego because you're too cool you know yeah. so that was the period where I was a you know teenager in my 20s you know in a band you know going to the pub you know Lego didn't feel even though it was still there I still wanted to I didn't let myself but then as I got older and wiser I thought you know what who cares <laughs> I want that back in my life you know so so yeah I've leaned heavily into it because it just brings such comfort and um and, and joy and you know it's, just, it's a nice thing to play with it's a nice thing to build and it's a nice thing to look at you know it's got everything you ever need Absolutely. Well, look, I'm so pleased to have you on today. You know, we connected when I was reading your first book and I was led to your first book, as you know, because my son was diagnosed as autistic about a year, 18 months ago now. It's been quite a long journey. And and throughout that journey, we've been on a real kind of learning process as a family, both in terms of understanding uh, my son better and, and how, you know, his place in the world and also us as a family and how that's going to shift our dynamic. So firstly, thank you for, you know, for writing the books you've been you've been writing. I want to kind of kick off with this launch of this new book. So the title of Untypical makes your stance very clear that the, the world as it stands right now um, isn't built for autistic people. So so why is that, Pete? And what can be done to make our world more inclusive? Well, I mean, I I always like to look at the positive side of everything. You know, when I say that the world isn't built for autistic people, I don't think that there's a kind of malevolence in that. You know, it's not like the world is is out to get us, you know, or trying to make us miserable. It's just a natural part of just, you know, happening to be a minority. The world has obviously, for the most part, been organized and developed and created by people who are neurotypical you know non-autistic and it's just a a, an unfortunate risk you know result of that is that it just doesn't quite fit us and i talk about it in untypical a little bit like i'm very tall 
Okay. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm like six foot seven. So, you know, kind of a little bit unusually tall, you know, like out of the normal bound, which means that the world isn't really built for me in a, in a physical sense. You know, I can't fit into cars. I can't fit into airplanes. I bang my head on door frames all the time, you know, washing up, I'm bent over and get bad back. And it's, it's a bit like that. You know, if, if you're not in the bell curve, you know, the big part of the bell curve, sure. then you're going to struggle. You know, you're going to struggle because the world just hasn't been purposefully designed to fit you in it. And that's where neurodivergent people fit, whether they're autistic or ADHD or dyslexic, dyspraxic, Tourette's. You know, the world just isn't set up for you. So the book is really a, it's it's an opening kind of statement of, look, it's actually really easy. You know, I'm not asking for the world to be rebuilt. It doesn't need to be. It it just needs to be tweaked slightly, often very cheaply, you know, and, and just with a little bit of better understanding, everything could be an awful lot better. You know, it's I, I'm not I'm not seeking to, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm not seeking to knock it all down and start again, because let's face it, that, that's not going to happen, especially at the moment with the kind of political climate we exist in. I'm sure. just saying, look, here's some information, read it, absorb it, then you'll have a better understanding of who you share your world, world with. And that will help. So what so what led to you writing these books then? Why did you feel like you were the, maybe the right person of the right voice to to open up the conversation <laughs> around inclusivity a bit more? Well, it, it, it happened by accident. It really did. You know, I didn't kind of set out to do it. I, I started writing a lot of tweets and blogs back when I was diagnosed, you know, and over, over the years after that. So I was diagnosed in 2017. And then by about 2019 or so, I started to write about it more because I've learned a lot. And I, I, I just wanted to to get some information out there. I realized that, you know, there were a lot of people that really didn't know very much about it at all. So I just started, you know, just tweeting stuff. Partly also just to make sense of it for myself. You know, I found that writing about it helped me figure it out too. You know, and the people that were responding to me and the autistic community online, like joining in on the conversation and replying and saying, yeah, this is me, or no, I don't have this, but I do have this, was was really enriching, you know, and it just made me feel like, okay, yeah, I'm making real sense of this now. And and it just grew and grew, you know, and, and the tweets were getting a lot of engagement and, you know, going viral mm. and all sorts of things. And, and basically, as a result of that, people approached me and said, would you like to write a book? And I was like, Okay, I'm I'm a very passive person. I'm not very active. You know, I, I react to things. I don't I don't you know <laughs> go out sure. and, and get things to happen. I was very lucky in that regard. You know, to have people literally come to me and say, "Oh, you know, these these are, these tweets are great. Do you think you could turn them into a book?" Of course, yes. Yeah, by all means, I'm happy to. You know, and, and it just went from there. But I do have a kind of constant imposter syndrome of, you know, yeah, what what gives me the right to do this? You know, like, how do well, you know why why am I doing this compared to somebody else? But I just remind myself that. You know, I mean, there's the obvious, well, someone's got to do it, obviously. But also, I've been given this opportunity. You know, people have come to me and said, can you write this? So I just want to make the most of that and just try to make the whatever I, you know, publish and whatever comes out as useful and as fair and as balanced and as helpful as it can possibly be. You know, so that it's not a wasted opportunity. Yeah. And I think, you know, imposter syndrome affects all of us. But the reality is, I think you've had a very interesting journey. And that's one of the things I wanted to kind of rewind a little bit. You just touched on it that, you know, you were officially diagnosed as autistic as an adult at the age of 34, whilst I believe you were you were still working as a as an English teacher. Um, so can you just talk with her a little bit, you know, the, the journey you went on in terms of what led up to that? And how you how you took the news at the time, and I guess how how that journey has been like for you since you've officially, you know, got this diagnosis of autism. Mm. Well, I mean, it all started by becoming a parent because obviously, you know, I didn't know I was autistic, you know, throughout my entire life up to that point. I think what had happened was I had rearranged the world around me to be so routine based and so kind of set in, in its structures that I could cope with it you know, in my, in my autistic way, because autistic people crave that because, you know, we're so stressed all the time because everything's mm. so stressful, you know, the sensory sensitivity, the communication problems, the the social anxiety and, and the difficulties in, in that, you know, it means that we're always at that kind of top end of what we can really cope with. So there's a tendency to, you know, slot into routines to reduce that stress. But of course, the moment you become a parent, all of that, gone. 
you know, yeah. I, I, the, it, it just all evaporated, especially because um, uh, the child was quite a bad sleeper, you know, like a really unusually bad sleeper and still is to an extent. So, yeah, it was it was it was difficult. You know, it, my routine evaporated all of the kind of systems and things that I'd subconsciously put into place in order to cope vanished well what, what and, I'm, I'm interested so what were if if you look back now with you know with eyes that are very aware of you know of autism what were some of those things that brought you solace and what was your routine that pre-children kind of grounded you it was it was very rigid almost to the minute you know what i would do on any given day like my my routine in the morning before work my routine at work my routine after uh, my weekend routine was very set i remember you know it was a very I, I would get up at a certain time. I would have my breakfast in a certain way. Always have the same thing. I mean, people probably hear this and think it sounds awful. You know, like this kind of regimented. No, I can, I can relate to that completely. Yeah, indeed. Or do you just remember? Do, like, you remember yeah, yeah, do you remember yeah, yeah, yeah. uninterrupted weekend breakfast? Do you know? Do you remember indeed. what they used to be like? I remember those. It's like a dizzy blur yeah. of what it was like. Yeah. I know, I know. And I used to have a thing where I'd go out for a coffee. I'd go to, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd pop to the local Waitrose because, you know, I'm, I'm so posh. But <laughs> there was just a Waitrose up the road. And that was back when they did free coffee. You know, yes. you didn't even have to buy anything. You just, I you know. That. So I'd, grab one. I'd, I'd just wander around the shop, you know, and it was very calming for me. I don't know why, but, but it, it helped. And just things like that, very, very rigid very very strict and it brought me solace and calm and of course you know when you've got a child that's unpredictable and doing things at all times of hours of the day you can't do any of that you know you really can't so so I found that 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 source of calm was gone so I was my, my stress levels were through the roof you know just always and uh, my, my other routine thing that I've depended and still do depend heavily on is solitude you know, just time alone to recharge and to to reevaluate and to process everything that's been going on. And you know, there, there was there was none of that available either. You know, so so it, it was it was a very difficult situation, and and it affected my mental health very badly to the point where I wanted to understand why it was affected so badly. You know, like why am I not coping with this? So so you know, why is it impacting me and to, to this extreme extent? And it was research. You know, I, I was just looking at possibilities, and I remember. Um, my partner sent me a, a questionnaire, you know, are you autistic kind of thing? And I filled it in and mm. it was like, you know, in Ghostbusters, when the, uh, when the needle on the PKE meter go, you know, buries yeah. the needle, you know, it's like <laughs> whoosh right down there. It was like that, you know, the, you know, the computer almost like started ringing alarm bells and saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think that you had to get something like 20 plus to be like, yeah, you might be autistic. I got like 45 or something, you know, ridiculous. And, and it just, it went from there. I, I, I then thought, okay, I mean, I can't trust this entirely, this this question. I want to look at, you know, some more info. But the more I read, the more obvious it became to me. And then I got the diagnosis, uh, which at the time was very quick. And I was very lucky in that, looking back, compared to how some mm. people have experienced it. You know, I, I was diagnosed, I think, within a year, which is wow. pretty good well, going. Had, we, had, we had three years door to door. Yeah. Um, obviously yeah. paper didn't help but it was That's a very thing, very right? long and frustrating process and what I was interested about was um I remember vividly when we when we told my son and we we mm -hmm. had been very open in talking about autism throughout that entire three-year period and within our family we had been we, we were very very aware of where that diagnosis was going there was no question for us um so we were very open in talking to him about it but I remember the day when we told him you know we had your letter back and it confirms you're autistic and he was really, really upset. He was, he was very, he took the news very badly. You know, I don't want to be different. I don't want to be unlike other people. Yeah. Um, and I was I was actually really surprised by how visceral that reaction was because until then he'd been talking about it in a bit of a, eh, okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. And there was something very strong for him to, to hear that yeah. and recognise that there was something where he doesn't maybe necessarily fit in with his yeah. peers. How, how, how did it feel for you to... To, to have that officially confirmed pete it was a i think there's a big difference between being a child and an adult with this mm. in terms of you know children i mean typically not always but you know peer pressure is a big thing wanting to fit in you know wanting to be like, like everyone else is a huge thing for a kid and i think i would have reacted just like your son if i've been diagnosed at that age because 
it's the last thing you want to hear. You know that, that you're different in some in some way. You know, unless you're a, 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 unless you're a very particular kind of child, then it's going to be tough. You know, you, no no one wants to hear they're different to their mates. You know, for any for any reason, especially with something that's a little bit mysterious. Because even if you've been open about it, there is still a mystery about autism. It, it, there's so much to it that it can be very easy to feel like you know I, I don't understand this. You know, I don't I don't genuinely don't get what this actually means. You know, it takes a lot of time and investment of energy well, to, also, to get a kind a... of amplified. It's not a one size fits all thing, is it? I mean, you say no, someone's autistic; no. it's so variable on the scale of yeah. how it affects people. Yeah, it is. You know, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, it just feeds into this thing of you know, well, what does that mean? And and you know, and just this general sense of not wanting to be different. Whereas for me as an adult, there was a lot more relief in it because as part of the process of kind of coming to terms with the likelihood, I was going back over my life. You know, and and just kind of reevaluating everything that had happened to you know to date, and trying to make sense of well, you know, does this kind of explain some things? You know, some some points in my life where maybe things were a bit miserable, or or where I didn't understand what happened, or all this kind of thing. And and finding out that that was the case, that I was autistic, and obviously had been autistic my entire life, was a. a an explanation of much that had happened, which was relieving to an extent, you know, because I just mm. felt like, well, okay, I mean, I'm still not happy about it, but at least I know now kind of why it happened. So, mm. you know, why, I don't know, friendships had gone sour or why social interactions had gone wrong or why I hadn't pursued certain things or hadn't understood certain things, you know, it all started to make more sense. And, and it did make me feel, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not like, like a useless person you know I'm not, I'm not a dreadfully you know my disorganization for example I can now at least explain it you know I know where it comes from you know and and uh, and it feels you know you don't want to be looking for excuses but it is a relief to find out that there is at least a reason that you can pinpoint and then and then you can start to work out actual ways that might help because it's based on something concrete rather mm. than just flailing around in the dark not knowing what to do so, so for anyone that's that's listening or watching this podcast today that doesn't really understand autism or how it can manifest itself, I mean, I know it's very subjective, but in your life, what what does it what does it mean for you? Well, I mean, I, I've taken to kind of breaking it down into four chunks that certainly fit my experience. I mean, obviously, it's generalized. We have to generalize to an extent because it's so varied. But but there are certainly four key kind of aspects that very are very very common that tend to be a you know big feature. So you've got the the, the communication struggles. You know, the communication differences. Um, autistic people versus non-autistic people. There's a there's a difference in the culture of communication there, which is quite considerable things to do with implication and assumption and unwritten rules and that kind of thing we we, we, we do it very differently you know autistic people generally tend to need things to be more clear communicated without implication whereas non-autistic people quite like implication you know especially i mean i found you know especially in the uk we love implication in this country everything's implied everything's yeah. hinted at you know whereas autistic people generally speaking don't work so well with that so it's and like that's been really interesting for me as a parent because that's one thing i've learned like the, i'm talking the most basic things here like for example it's time for you to do your teeth now versus can you please do your teeth yes uh, and so <laughs> yes, there's very different things that, that i've learned through language over the last couple of years in terms of when i need things done it's not a can you please do this to fit within my schedule it is you need to do this now and it feels yes. Yes. it feels as a parent you know it, it, it's been quite a hard challenge to go through that because it feels a bit disempowering it feels like you're dictating what should mm -hmm. be done when you really want to empower but actually i find with my son if i'm very clear and just say it is time for you to do this now do it yes that works really well and yeah. and, and it removes that ambiguity yeah. so we, we've kind of changed our relationship in terms of how i speak with him and that's how i want to be spoken to as well you know by, by people i want people to just be very very clear just like that mm. you know um i, I i'm I, it's not just the fact that it makes me feel more confident in what i'm doing it calms me down because it removes the need for my brain to scan for possible other meanings mm. which Autistic people, generally speaking, can't do automatically. I often use the analogy of non-autistic people seem to, you know, the, the whole communication experience, a lot of it seems to be on automatic, like an automatic car. You know, it, it just does it. You know, the gear changes just happen. Understanding just happens. And, you know, they don't even really know why. They, 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 just, they just get it. Whereas for autistic people, it's more manual. You know, in every utterance, we have to really analyze it and scan it multiple times, you know are they hinting at something here are they and you know that's what we call overthinking isn't it and, yeah. it, and it is you know and and 
obviously it's very prone to go wrong you know so i find that every single time you know by this age you know i've learned that people imply stuff all the time and they always have so by the time i'm now nearly 40 um every time anyone says anything to me my first my brain's first reaction is to assume that there is some secondary meaning to it mm. even when obviously there might not be and that's difficult because it means that i can then ascribe intentions and motives to people that aren't even there because i've been conditioned to search for that stuff in what's said it's all very manual and it's all very clunky it just doesn't work very well you know? no, it's, and it's hard not... because as you say in british society that we don't really say what we think do we we yeah. there's always a subtext yeah. we're, we're not very good at being we're just not a direct society indeed, must make indeed. Very challenging i i mean it's a, it's a very kind of controversial subject but i would be fascinated by a kind of a study, a, you know, a fair comparison of autistic experience just in that particular issue um, between American autistic people and, and, and British autistic people, because I think mm -hmm. there would be a, some interesting findings there, given the, the, I suppose it's a bit stereotypical, but the, the difference of communication styles in the two countries. I mm -hmm. would be fascinated to, I wouldn't want to make any, you know, assertions about conclusions, but I would be fascinated to see if there is a difference. It's something that I don't think people tend to look at very much because most autism research is based on treatment and cures and things like that. But anyway, I mean, back to the, the, the other three aspects of autism. I mean, another one is what we call uh, monotropism. That, that's a term that was coined by Dinah Murray. And it, it describes that, that ability to focus in on a single issue, a single problem or a single topic or a single person or whatever it might be with, with you know, incredible focus you know, an almost unbreakable focus, uh, as opposed to what might be seen as a non-autistic polytropism, where you can kind of take in everything at once to an extent, you know, you can have multiple kind of focuses at any given time. Um, and that's what can lead to things like special interests, you know, that singular focus on a topic, which you can't stop thinking about, it's just there constantly, and it won't yeah. go away. But it also explains things like why autistic people might struggle to go from one activity to another. You know, that kind of changing focus can be very slow and tricky. And we need a bit more time and patience for, you know, to, to, to be able to affect that shift. You know, I describe it in the book as, you know, um, a lot of non-autistic people can change focus quite quickly, you know, like a, like a, like a, a fighter jet can change direction quite abruptly, you know, whereas yeah. autistic people are more like an oil tanker, very slowly turning, you know, very gradually changing direction because it's just the way, it's just the way our brains work. I'm really interested before you get on to the other two. So obviously, you know, you're a father and we were talking about the unpredictability of children. So how are, how are you... You know, obviously, you've got your own way of operating and making it through the day and moving from from, let's say, task to task, whatever it may be that's taking your attention. But obviously, children don't play by that rule book. So how do you how do you navigate the fact that actually you might be deeply focused on something and then your attention is completely taken away? How have you managed to um, overcome that over the years? very badly <laughs> to be honest you know i i haven't found a, a way to you know kind of address it i i just i just have to accept it you know but it means that i spend a lot of my day more stressed than i would otherwise be and in a state of kind of constant almost confusion i think this 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 adds a lot to my disorganization because you know i'll be focused on something and then yeah my attention will be ripped away by something you know put those scissors down or, or whatever it is you yeah. know and, and i'll forget whatever i was doing and then that's forgotten forever. I'll mm. be reminded like a week later when I get an email saying, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you, you're doing this. And I'll be like, oh my God, I forgot, you know. So, so yeah, I, I, I am not a great poster boy for um for how to have had, how to have developed coping strategies for that particular thing, because I think it's probably the, the aspect of being autistic that's most disabling for me. You know, that that attention changing and, and a, a resistance to change, you know, this what we call autistic inertia, you know, like wanting to stay on the same thing. It's probably the strongest autistic trait that I have. And, and I, yeah, I, I struggle mightily with it. You know, if anyone else has any has any methods that they you well, know, come up with, then I, I saw you talking about um, is it executive dysfunction. You were talking yes, about yeah, is, that's is that right term where, you, where you were talking about kind of am I right in saying that's kind of overwhelms? I think you were talking in the context of millions of emails, millions of LinkedIn posts, millions of Instagram, whatever it might be. Um, is that right that you were kind of talking about the flitting from one to another and that overwhelm of too much, too yeah, many so conflicting to things at once? 
yeah, to an extent. I mean, that's that's more the monotropic side. The executive dysfunction side is 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 more the inability to be able to prioritize it all and plan out the day and and organize all that kind of conflicting chaos. Um, so they're very tightly connected. I mean, um, executive dysfunction is one of the other you know one of the four things. And um, so you know, yeah, it's it's it's. It's more like with executive dysfunction, it, it, because that's a, that's a play on the term executive function, which is a basic fundamental part of the brain's architecture. You know, it's, it's a big thing that, you know, the human brain does, which is planning, organization. You know, it's, it's one of the things that makes humans human. And yeah, autistic people, very often, it, it just doesn't work properly. You know, it's a, a, again, it's like a, a more kind of obvious aspect of disability, because it can cause, as you can imagine, huge problems, you know, in the workplace, with relationships, with all kinds of things, you know, being being very disorganized, and very forgetful. Okay, so does that function into things like, for example, you know, I've got a meeting, in a city an hour away in two hours time so i need to factor in how, yes, how i'm yes. going to get there how long it's going to get take me to get there what could go wrong mm-hmm. along the way and then having to take that exactly. extra step in times of that which must be very stressful to navigate if if the very act yeah. of going to that place is is quite overwhelming in and of itself yeah exactly that yes and and even if you manage it like even if i manage to to, to still make it and, and get there on time I think it's fair to say it will have taken me an awful lot more energy and time and brain kind of power to have managed to achieve that. You know, it, it's, a, it's much harder to achieve it even when you succeed uh, than it might be for somebody else who doesn't have that disability, you know. So, you know, you're, you're left exhausted, but just, just by the very act of managing to get to the thing. You know, I am unusually disorganized. You know, there's disorganization, which is something that a lot of people experience. A lot of people feel, well, you know, I'm a bit disorganized, got a pile of papers on my desk and all this kind of thing. And then there's the then there's another level of it, you know, where where it, it becomes it really impacts your life. You know, you miss out on opportunities. You you fail to get things organized to you. I think it's why, as I said earlier, I'm quite a passive person because I can't be active because I can't organize it. You know, I can't I can't kind of go out and, and, and set about making change because I'd forget it all and I'd get, you know. But then the flip side of that, and I see this in my son, I see it in you, you know, you, you have, you, you say you're disorganised and you say you're passive, but then, you know, you've written these two fantastic <laughs> books there. You really have. But also more than that, you've, you know, you've galvanised this, you know, very passionate community on social media. You're incredibly active and, and kind of influential across these channels. So you say you're disorganised, but clearly there are certain areas and special instances that you have that you are very strong at. So, for example, writing these books, you know, writing a book is a is a huge time commitment. Did you find that was something that you could like fully focus on and and block out days to write on as your one focus for that day? How, how do you tackle something like writing a 10,000 word book or, or something like that? 60,000 <laughs> 60, 50, word, words. Yeah. I was going to say, that's, that's a short essay, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was... I have a history of not being able to finish things. You know, I, I get grand ideas and I start them and then it never gets completed. You know, so, for example, a lot of hobbies have been like that. You know, like I'd set about making a train set, you know, like a train layout and never get anywhere with I think, it. Or, I think we all I, have that. I, don't, I, I think that's Yes, just, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah that's true. That is true. So so I was very worried when I agreed to write the first book and sign that contract. A big part of me was thinking, you're not going to be able to do this. <laughs> you know, was it very you, clear you have to deliver your first draft by this deadline as part of that contract? Yes, yeah. very much so. Very much so. I was, you know, so I was quite nervous. And looking back, I am actually still amazed that I did get them finished because I, I, very occasionally I would get into the zone of the, the, the kind of uh, monotropic focus zone with with the book you know there were a few occasions where i'd like look up after a few however long and be like oh, i've written two chapters that's good <laughs> you know but a lot of the rest of the time i would really struggle because i'm also i'm actually in a waiting process for an adhd diagnosis okay um which is a very interesting push pull relationship between autism and adhd and people who are who, who experience both and i actually found it frequently very hard to focus on the book so it's like for me mo- the monotropic side sometimes it's in ascendancy sometimes it's there and, I, and you know it can be relied upon you know for me to focus other times it doesn't work for me and i'll be all over the place you know looking at all kinds of other things you know and, and distracting myself and things like that so so that made the book actually very very difficult I found that I wrote both books, apart from those few times where I had that, managed to, you know, kind of secure the monotropic state. Most of the books were written in very short bursts. 
you know, 100, 200 word stints, you know, and then I put it down again, which is a very fractured way to write anything, you know, mm. but then that's how I used to do essays at university. That's how I've always done writing. That's, all, that's how I've always done work, you know, in these short, sharp bursts rather than lengthy things. Are you, are, and you comes, driven, are you driven by deadlines? Does it help that you're suddenly under a lot of pressure much, and suddenly yes. you have to, yeah, that's always yeah. been me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like the, the day before the deadline, that's when it all, ah, okay, got to get it done. And and it's it's difficult because it sounds very contradictory because here I am saying autism is all about monotropism. And yet then I'm saying, but for me, actually, I'm all over the place. And that's why the autism ADHD contrast is a very difficult thing to explain. You know, and I, I did a podcast with, uh, with 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 somebody a while back about this very thing. And, it, and it, it's a very tricky dance that ADHD and autism do together. Sometimes the ADHD takes charge and leads, you know, sometimes the autism takes charge and leads. Um, and other times they're fighting with each other and uh, you don't know what's going on. Uh, and, it, and it means that you can you can come across as very contradictory, very, very confusing to, to an onlooker, you know, an onlooker who might say, for example, but yesterday you were like this and now today you're like this. And it's like, well, yeah, because yesterday I was kind of, that was autistic me yesterday this is adhd me today for a reason that i don't understand you know they 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 it's 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 very very tricky to uh to elucidate you know exactly what's going on there but yeah, yeah the book writing process was tough it was difficult but are you, are you really proud to have both those books out now and you know to know that you've <laughs> well, achieved you know, it yeah they're finished you because know also, I mean, they, they, came out in, they came out in very quick succession were you writing them both it's in tandem or for a time yes there was a there was a period of overlap um where i was just finishing what i want to talk about you know and, and getting those la like last tweaks done because as you can imagine if i'm writing it in little stints i had to do quite a lot of kind of gluing of the pieces together to make it actually flow um so i was doing that just as i was starting on typical and it, it was yeah that was that was intense, you know, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a bit of a gap now between books, you know, rather than this, you know, very quick, you know, I think six months is the gap between the first two books, which is a that's bit, a, a bit silly, really. Yeah, like you've, you've talked in, um, you've talked in your first book about, I particularly liked this, this piece I pulled out, that you, you rebuilt your own understanding of yourself in your mid-30s, rather like undergoing a nuclear-powered version of a midlife crisis, um, and, and, and while I while I love the description, you know, I can only imagine how hard that has been for you to navigate. I mean, it's been half a decade or so now since your diagnosis, and I know you're obviously still on this journey with you know ADHD and ex exploring. But do you feel that you have a a better sense now of who you are and your identity in your world than you did pre 2017? I, I think so. I think so. It it mostly transpires in my own expectations of myself. Um, I, I'm far fairer with myself now than I was, um, because I know I know what I can do and I know my capabilities, and I'm 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 more inclined to forgive my, myself if I struggle, you know, and to acknowledge, yeah, that was difficult, and you know, you're you're pushing yourself too hard, because before the diagnosis, I was just perpetually disappointed in myself. You know, why am I so disorganized? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do what everyone else seems to find really easy? You know, um, and, and it, it becomes a source of shame and embarrassment and all sorts of other negative emotions, you know. And and yeah, since then, you know, over the last five years, I, I, I found a lot of peace in admitting and accepting that, yeah, I struggled for a reason, you know, and, and I shouldn't beat myself up over it. And, and that, that helps a lot. And it actually means that I can paradoxically take a little bit more on because, I can be more careful and choosy, you know, pick and choose what I know I can cope. This podcast, for example, yes, I can do that. You know, that's something I can definitely do. Whereas going on a trip up to the north of England, for example, to deliver a talk, I probably can't do that. As much as I'd love to, it's probably unrealistic given I everything. I mean, but you have but you have done that. And I was going to ask that. So, so you know, how, how have you found, you know, you've done these big conferences with the National Autistic Society. How have you found, bit, and, you know, I've, I've watched the videos, you've, you, know, you come across as in, incredibly confident on that stage. How yeah. have you found that experience of speaking to rooms full of people about this? 
Well, it's interesting because I haven't done it as much as I would have liked to have done because of COVID. You know, I, I did the I, I did that talk uh, in Birmingham for the NAS, yeah, which is on YouTube. You know, about uh, the, the the like a day in the life of a school autistic school child, and then, yeah, that was that was great. You know, really well appreciated. And then COVID happened, <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, no one's going anywhere for a long time, and and we had to be particularly careful because of vulnerability in this household. So, you know, we have very much been hermits, you know, in, in, in this house for the whole time. So apart from a very few opportunities, most of it's been online, which is, you know, it's good in some respects because it's more manageable. But I do I do like to be there. You know, I do like because I'm a teacher. When I was on stage doing the, the Birmingham talk and whenever I'm physically in a location doing these talks, I just go into teacher mode. I put my mm. teacher mask on and and I'm fine. You know, that's that's a that's a persona, I think, that I've developed over the years to to cope with a kind of very, very fragile sense of confidence. Because, I, you know, I, I think I come across far more confident than I actually am. If we're going to really, you know, get really yeah. kind of into the nitty gritty. And so, so I wear this mask of, you know, exuberant kind of like, yeah, I'm fine. You know, look at me go all arms waving all over the place, very, very free and um, enjoying it. But inside, there's this kind of terrified person who's like, why are you doing this? What are you doing to yourself? It, it's interesting. I enjoy it and I and I find it difficult in equal measures. You know, it's exhilarating, but it's exhausting. And afterwards, I will invariably need to lie down, you know, somewhere. Like, just say, because when you do things like that, it's not it's not just giving the talk and finishing the talk. There's then invariably lots of people wanting to come up to you afterwards and talk to you about the talk and yeah. share their experiences. Yeah. And, and you'll have the same with, you know, book tours of that's online or in person you know there's lots yes. of kind of outpouring of people projecting their experiences or, or emotions on you i mean how do you find that bit do you find that you can navigate that but then afterwards you need to essentially retreat from a world for a bit and you could almost probably you know like if you've got a bit of an old phone uh, you know a phone that's old enough and decrepit enough that the app, you can see the battery level declining like you can literally see the pixels going down I always feel like it's, I'm a bit like that, like it, that there is after I do something like that, if there is a bit of a networking thing afterwards, then, yeah, my time there is limited. You know, I, I, I won't last for long. I can do it and I will be around and I will, you know, and I, I, I like it. I like meeting people. It's, it's a weird dichotomy. I, I like solitude. I'm a very, very solitude based person, but I do like meeting. I like talking to people, but I just can't do it for very long. You know, it really does drain my battery incredibly fast. Um, I remember at the Birmingham conference, you know, after after I'd done my talk, you know, there was a break and everyone went for coffee. And yeah, you know, lots of people coming up and talking to me, which I've never really experienced before. You know, that was my, uh, I remember, you know, being at the conference for the first time in my entire life, people were like, that's Pete Warmby. And I was like, ooh, that's a bit weird. You know, <laughs> I don't know who these people are, but they know who I am, you know, because of Twitter and stuff. Um, and I found that whole experience very odd, but I enjoyed it. You know, we talked, but then I literally had to go to the hotel room that they booked in for. You know, I had to stay over because it was a journey. Um, I went up to the hotel room and I just lay down for an hour just to recharge, which is kind of socially completely unacceptable. <laughs> like, you know, it's not okay to do that. But but with with the you know the population oh, yeah. of the comms being mostly autistic, it was yeah, fine. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I agree with that because I think you know one thing. One thing COVID taught me certainly that kind of 2020 period was you know I, I found a real realignment in myself from someone who'd been very very busy and frantic for 15 years, essentially always following the schedule of you know clients or train services yeah. or whatever it may be, um, and then suddenly all that was stripped away, and and I found a real um regeneration and rest and actually my yep. working patterns have never returned to what they were mm -hmm. before you know working for myself now I work in lots of short bursts of very very focused time I'm much like you <laughs> yes. I can I can jump that's why we've we've had this conversation about potential kind of neurodiversity on my side because I can literally segment from one client to the next to the next from one task to the next I can have this conversation with you and in 10 minutes I can completely just move on to the next piece and then come back to this yeah much like you, I think I'm that I can just, which makes me very, very effective at my job handling multiple clients. Yes. Doesn't yep. make me quite so good sometimes um, about having like a deep and meaningful conversation with someone in purpose or in person for yep. two hours. And um, but it, but it's it's yes. really interesting. Yep. And I I I think there's a lot to be said for um, periods of retreat and calm and Seneca. Okay, yep. Actually, I've I've reached my I've reached the end of my kind of. Uh, period of what i can cope with at this particular moment i'm yeah. just going to regenerate whether that's having a lie down 
um, mm-hmm. you know, going for a walk in nature, reading a book, uh, meditating, yes. whatever, yeah. whatever but the individual solve may be. But I, I think as a society, we need to get much better at moving away from hustle culture and much yes. more about just yeah. slowing down I, a bit. I, I, I think so. Busy. I think so. Yeah, I mean, the number of people who are neurodivergent for a start, you know, ADHD, autistic, you know, that we, we, we will benefit from that almost invariably. Um, but the number of neurotypical people would probably benefit from it too. And that's actually something that I push quite a lot because I, I do feel like a lot of the stuff that we could put in place that would just make the world more and more welcoming to autistic people, like... I don't know, like an acceptance of, you know, downtime, you know, a bit more downtime between things and um, reducing the the busyness of spaces, you know, for the sensory sensitivity side of things and being a bit more explicit in our conversations and a bit more, you know, a bit less ambiguity would probably help everybody. (laughs) You know, it's not limited to autistic people, you know, that's going to assist everybody you know we would all probably feel a bit better if our instructions from our bosses were more precise and clearer you know with no no inference required but it's a difficult culture shift to affect so it is but we've moved we've moved a long way very quickly we've become a very 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 busy society within a space Mm -hmm. of a couple of decades and i would i would question whether that busyness has made us any more productive and better at what we did. Um, what, there's, there's one area, um, you know, we're not going to cover everything today, but, you know, about this topic, but there's one area that really fascinates me, which is, this is very prevalent in my son throughout his childhood. You talk about this absolute devotion to justice. Um, and you've talked about yes. it in terms of your 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 love for all things Marvel and, and the link there. Mm. What, why, why do you believe that justice is so important to the neurodiverse community? It's a very good question. Uh, and in the in the new book, in Untypical, the whole of the eighth chapter is all about that. It's like and what I, I end the book on that note, you know, looking into, um, you know, why is this? Some notable people are obviously, you know, famously autistic who seem to have this kind of drive for, for change. And I've come to the conclusion that if it's anything, it's a complete unwillingness to accept what you might call, you know, bull s word you know i don't want to swear on your podcast but it's a it's a a complete inability to accept things that are clearly nonsensical and clearly just wrong you know i think it's very interesting that society has an enormous tolerance of rubbish really does you know you see it with lying politicians and you know the, the whole thing that people say you know well, I don't know, a politician lies egregiously on on tv or something and and then you're a load of other people like people in the public just saying well that's what politicians do isn't it you know Mm. and 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 it's that that i think autistic people maybe don't do we can't accept it we had some very interesting discussions in the the midst of the pandemic around a certain former prime minister and why certain former prime minister wasn't in there was like a for breaking for breaking their own laws that they created and and i was just Mm -hmm. having to turn to Mm -hmm. say i haven't actually got an answer for that i genuinely can't give you any reason why that particular yes. unnamed individual yeah. is not being brought to justice for breaking laws that other people yeah. were brought to justice for breaking. I haven't got an answer for you, and I wish I did. Yeah, um, it's. I think that there is a tolerance. I mean, I've got to be very careful here because there's massive generalizations, you know, left, yes. right, and centre here. But I think that there is a there is a tolerance for that within society. You know, for some reason, it's viewed as well. I, I, whether it's lethargy, like we just can't be bothered to fight it, or whether it's just accepting bad behavior because it's just you know it's so everywhere that what you know what can we possibly do um but i think that autistic people for whatever reason and it might be related to the social communication thing you know that that in inability to deal with ambiguity it might be linked with that like it, it might be because things have to be clear and there's nothing clear about how laws work and how how accountability works in society as a whole it's so opaque it's so totally lacking in transparency. You know, the, the the people who are in power and who are wealthy can get away with this, these things. People who aren't can be in prison for decades for small things, you know. And, and I think that that's something that autistic people, because of a because it's so ambiguous and because it's so opaque, we we just as a as a whole we just can't cope with it it just doesn't make any sense and we just can't mm. accept it and i can feel myself getting quite et- 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 yeah like, you know i know, um, I know we're talking in real generalizations here and we can't speak for the whole autistic community but do you no, think that no. gives the flip side of that does that give real power to affect change in terms of this inability i will not accept that and there are better ways and i'm able to propose better ways i hope so 
It, it, I really hope so. And, and I do wonder. I mean, people love to speculate about the people of the past who have affected great change. And, you know, what if they were neurodivergent? Well, who knows? We, we can't mm. possibly say. Um, but it's certainly an interesting thought experiment. I mean, you know, you can't just go around saying that people are autistic when you don't know. But it does make you wonder what impact. Because autism has always been around, of course. You know, there's this kind of scaremongering that, you know, oh, it's, you know, it's increasing, it's increasing. Well, no, diagnosis is increasing. You know, we're, we're becoming more aware of just how many people, you know, what, what percentage of the human population is autistic. That's what we're better at now. We've always been there. We just didn't know it, you know, and it, it doesn't make you wonder, you know, what historic autistic people might have done and how they might have coped and how, you know, what would it have been like to have been autistic in the Middle Ages? I, I can't even, yeah. you know, get my yeah. head around it. But, you know, it does make you wonder if there had been autistic people born into wealth, born into aristocracy, who had the ability and the time and the, the health to be able to do things, what they might have achieved. And we'll never really know. But it does make you wonder. And, and I would like to think, and I do hope, I think, deep down, that autistic people may well have a lot to offer the world. I'm resistant to go down the superpower route um, because... You know, that, 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 that thing that people say, you know, autism is a superpower, because very frequently for a lot of autistic people, it really doesn't feel like it. You know, and it, mm -hmm. it feels like it kind of erases the, 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 the struggles and the challenges that we might face a little bit. So I'm not I'm not fond of that wording. Mm -hmm. But I do think anyone who has a different way of doing things and a different way of looking at the world compared to the majority has always got the potential, I think, to to make change happen, either on a small or a large scale, because there's that just difference of view. And, you know, we're learning that there's a large minority of people with a very significant difference in view out there. And we're starting to get a bit of a voice. We're, we're starting to get on social media. We're talking. We're, we're explaining our lives. We're, we're challenging authorities. We're, we're saying, no, we need to change this. No, we need to look at things differently. And I don't think that's going to go away. <laughs> I think that's only going to increase. I'm excited to see what the impact of that will be and what the outcomes are likely to be, because I think it, it has the potential to be quite stunning. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'm a believer, you know, there are platforms like this, every, every time there's a podcast like this, or there's a, an opportunity to do something on social media, you know, there are far more opportunities now for yes. yeah. these voices to get out there and have a real mm. impact. One of the things I would love to talk about, because obviously we can see it in the background of your wonderful room there, is your special <laughs> your special interest so you've done a great job with your first book of you know on the face of it talking about all these these special interests from minecraft to lego to dinosaurs to even the titanic um but what you've done in the context of that is be able to create a very rich narrative for your journey and what it is to, to live with autism um you know i've i can identify mm. with it very strongly i've had very two big special interest in my life being ghostbusters and wrestling and rarely does an hour pass in the day when i'm not thinking about one of them they're taking up my creative energy much <laughs> to my poor wife's chagrin what what role do these special interests play in your life uh, how, how do they help you oh, wow well, i mean yeah it, they're, they're they're immensely important they they really are yeah you know, I, I can't underestimate the importance that they have they they are the, the most kind of consistent source of joy that I have probably other than being a, a parent in that I can rely on them very much, you know, that they will always be there, you know, and I can always well, nearly always guarantee that, you know, I'm going to be able to get lost in them. And it's that act of getting lost in them. That's so calming and relaxing because I struggle to be relaxed. I really do. This isn't necessarily something that all autistic people have, but a good number of us do like an inability to, to calm because things are so stressful anyway. But but special interests are, are pretty much the only real way that I have to, to achieve that peace, you know, and a peace of mind. Like stop the, the chaos in my head, you know, the, the autistic ADHD kind of maelstrom of, of overthinking and panicking and worrying sure. and all that stuff. It just calms it all down. And, and I can, you know, read about the Titanic or, or, or build some Lego or play a bit of Minecraft or play some music and... and all of that goes away for a while you know um and yeah it, it's that they're, they're a rich source of of focus and joy 
but also learning you know i i love learning i like finding out new things it's 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 a big part of you know who i am i'm i'm, I'm very much a a trivia per you know i want to know stuff i want to know everything if, if possible you know um so so again you know it enables me to to learn new things and to and, and sometimes you get a new special interest you know i mean it doesn't happen often at my age you know because the ones i have are very ingrained you know but recently i've sure. really got into the beat it really got into the beatles and I've just found this is a very rich source of there's a lot, <laughs> you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff about that band. Um, so it, it kind of feels like I've, 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 um, you know, like in Minecraft when you when you're mining and you come across like a a seam of gold ore or something that just goes on for miles. It's like oh my word, this is brilliant. You know, dig yeah. away. It's like that. I've found this rich seam of information that's probably never going to run out because the number of mm. books and films and stuff about the beatles is huge so I, I you know i've got this kind of giddy feeling of so much <laughs> so much so much to read because i've read nearly everything about the titanic you know I, i've been into it all my life so i've you know there's, there's a lot of books but i've read most of them you know so you end up rereading and that kind of thing but you have got this whole new one now which is just inexhaustible which i can just throw my, myself and that's, into. and that's something very special about these interests isn't it because i think for me with with the examples of wrestling and ghostbusters you know having mm -hmm. been a fan of both for about 35 years but yeah. you know i find that now for example I, i'm hyper focused on learning much more about the era of or era of kind of the 1950s to 1970s of of mm. wrestling so an era that was mm. before i was mm. born and um, i have no yeah. cultural link to whatsoever but it's almost like i've exhausted the last four decades and yeah. now i need to go back further to unearth some new yes. gems um i was fascinated in your book about there's a, there's a piece where you talk about things i'd never discovered about the titanic in terms of how there were multiple multiple small factors that if any of those had changed even slightly yeah that would not have happened and I, mm -hmm. I, I'd never, I'd never, I'd heard certain theories, but I'd never seen them all written down on a single page in terms of how many yes. small, <laughs> small, tiny things added up for this catastrophe. I, I think it was the only bullet point list in the entire book, wasn't it? Like, yes. I'd avoided them. <laughs> and then it was like, no, I've got to do a bullet point list here. Because, yeah, because I, I feel very strongly about this. It's, it's interesting because, again, it's this is where special interests and the justice thing kind of link in. Because... It's very interesting when you've got a, such a deep, when you're when you're an expert in something or, or you know an amateur expert in something say um and, and you hear people who don't know so much about it talking about it and getting it wrong that's when the hackles raise you know it's like i don't know whether you ever watched alan partridge but there's that wonderful <laughs> scene in um when he's in his caravan where all of his friends are talking about james bond but they don't they're, they're getting it all wrong and he yes. loses it you know he's like you, you stop it you know you, you're getting it all wrong um which which i can identify with and yeah that titanic moment in the book was 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 a it was like a preemptive one of those like people are always like oh but have you heard the conspiracy theory about the it was actually the olympic and oh but it had brittle steel didn't it it wasn't very well built and all this kind of thing i'm just like no none of that is true none of it none of it has any evidence but it's become part of popular culture and it's hard to fight that you know once something becomes received wisdom mm. you know i, I, I hope you have like that I, I hope that you have like a powerpoint presentation prepared so if anyone dares to say this you know so <laughs> yes. actually let me take you through this in a three-hour conversation on the rare occasion but professional wrestling it you know which is very kind of maligned in mainstream media but whenever mm. it's mentioned in a mainstream uk newspaper there'll always be a typo, there'll always be an error, there'll always be a yeah. name will be spelt wrong or something that's grossly inaccurate and it drives me wild yep. because I'm, I know that my new show of data. Um, yes. yeah. I'm really conscious of your time, Pete, but there was, there was one thing I kind of wanted to ask, which is before we wrap up. So, because um, that links very clearly to untypical. So I know it's your belief, that, uh, you know, it's very much my belief too, as, as a father of, of an autistic child, that, you know, the main barrier to autistic people living their best life is a lack of understanding and awareness and acceptance amongst the neurotypical population. You know, you've said in this talk that we're coming a long way, but there's still obviously a long way to go. Are there any kind of big things that you think need to change on this road to more understanding and inclusion? A good question. I, I think a lot of it boils down to, I've often said a lot of it boils down to patience, just to just patience, which which comes of understanding, I believe. Because the, the, the whenever anyone is confronted with something that's different, there is an initial knee-jerk reaction of rejection. You know, we, we, 
for whatever reason, as a species, we don't deal with difference well. And, you know, the, the history of the human race has quite a few very unpleasant examples of where that can be taken to extreme. I feel that very often that, that rejection is, is born of fear and confusion and anger of the difference because it doesn't make any sense. We don't understand it. I don't get it, you know, so I don't like it. Um, and I, I believe that if there is a bit more understanding out there, if the difference that autistic people, you know, the difference of autistic people as opposed to non-autistic people is better understood, then rather than that knee-jerk negative reaction, we're more likely an automatic positive reaction. And that would usually take the form, in my opinion, of just patience, of, of, of time and of willingness to accept whatever the different behaviour is. So a really good example of, of an autistic behaviour that, that might flag up this all oh, different is bad kind of reaction is what we call stimming. So, for example, the whole time we've been talking, I've got a Lego figure here uh, that I've been fiddling with the whole time. Stimming is a is a, is a physic usually a physical action. So, for example, you know I'm doing something very inobtrusive because over my life I've learned that it's best to keep it on the down low. But a lot of you know autistic children, for example, they haven't learned that it's not acceptable to do these movements. So they just do them. You know, so mm. they might be getting up and down all the time. They might be rocking in their chair. They might be tapping on the desk. They might be pulling and tweaking their hair. They could be doing anything. Lots of different physical movements, even sounds. You know, to be making noises. Um, all as a way. And it's fascinating because we learn to do it to moderate our own stress levels. It's amazing that we do it. We, we learn that ourselves. Mm. And yet, as you can probably imagine, autistic children in the classroom or at home or in town doing any of those things will be met with opposition. Mm -hmm. They'll be met we've, with. We've, we've faced it in, in multiple scenarios over the last few years. I can well yeah. relate. With my, yeah. my, my, my son's stim is very, very prevalent at this point. It's you know, it's very visually obvious, it's very noisily obvious, and it's caused a lot of disruption, both um, when we've been out and about, but also when we've been in the classroom. And he does a fantastic job of masking. He really does. I mean, he's, yes. yeah. he, he's so hyper aware, but he, mm. he can't. And, and and I always know, and I think this is one of the things that's, that, that's come with slowing down and building our family much more around his autism. You know, we are very aware if he's getting anywhere close to overwhelm. Now you can see it from a mile off. Mm. Yeah. Um, and in a way, it's very yeah. helpful for us as parents to say, OK, we can see he's starting to stim. Things are things are obviously moving in a direction. Let's see what we can do to kind of steady the ship a bit. Yeah. And and there's the patience, you see, that I'm talking about, because you know about it. You, you've you had the opportunity to learn and you know more about it now, a lot, a lot more about it. And as a result of that, you've got that patience. You know, I you're, do, you're but able I, but to only take because I've made, Only because I've made the kind of neurotypical mistakes and I've, you know, had put my of son course, into yes, lots yeah. of situations, societal situ situations. We've gone places, we've done things which clearly he can cope with and he's had meltdowns. And yeah, I've gone through yeah. that whole roller coaster ride of anger and frustration mm -hmm. and why can't you just deal with this? And, you know, it's yeah. taken me years of years of learning and unlearning what he yeah. can and can't cope with and what actually works well for him and, and when he's living his best life and so as much as possible we try and yeah. just build yeah. our world around when he's at his best yeah and, and i think you know really what i suppose what i'm pushing for is a kind of global version of of, of, that, of your individual story you know mm. a, a, a gradual move from you know not knowing about it and reacting as everyone tends to react to things that are unexpected and annoying you know and why are you doing that to to uh, to knowing why it is and then that that building that patience and an ability to step back and, and not react negatively and you know initially because i'm the same you know i mean i did this with the people and i did it to myself before i knew about it you know because it's different and it's odd and we don't have a frame of reference for it so we just react typically quite badly to it but yeah. but if if we can get to the point where you know the whole population or at least a majority of the population had an understanding of autism just raised a little bit I'm not saying they need to all be experts, but just raised a little bit, just that raising of consciousness. I, I feel like just a 1% increase in the amount of patience the non-autistic community can have for the autistic community across the planet would obviously be cumulatively a massive difference. And every subsequent 1% increase, you know, I, I'm a big believer in small increments having a massive, in, you know, massive impact, you know, really have. And I'd like to think that untypical will help help hmm. increment it up another one percent you know just so there is a, that little bit more acceptance in the world that little bit more patience that little bit more understanding and it can just be continually built on until we live in a society where if you see somebody stimming 
if you see a, a stranger in the street stimming, your initial reaction isn't, ooh, what on earth are they doing? It's more along the lines of, oh, oh uh, they're probably autistic. That's fair enough. Not not necessarily verbally. You're not going to go around saying that. But, you know, that's what you'll think. You'll be like, oh, autistic person. Fine. Cool. Yes. Okay. Carry on with your day. That's yeah. the that's the aim. That's the challenge. Yeah. Well, like apart from your your excellent books, if anyone listening today who wants to learn more about autism and neurodiversity more generally, are there any resources that you'd point them towards that you found very helpful on your journey of self discovery, Pete? There are, yes. I mean, the, the most useful thing that you can really do as a starting point is to get onto social media because that's where most of the really current and cutting edge stuff is that's where autistic people themselves feel confident and comfortable to share their stories um so you, you'll be getting it direct you know rather than through an intermediary so go online get on twitter get on instagram if you're younger get on tiktok i suppose Are you, on <laughs> you know TikTok? youtube no no I, <laughs> I find it overwhelming and alarming a lot of the time but uh, yeah. you know i appreciate that some people are um and, and just do you know search terms you know search actually autistic or autistic adults or autistic advocate or something along those lines and just see who you can find you know there, there are there are thousands of autistic people willingly and for no reason other than wanting to improve things are putting themselves out there to, to share their experience and you know the more people read that stuff watch the videos look at the pictures look at the memes whatever it might be the better you know and 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 i mean the the final word in untypical i think the, the like the final couple of sentences or the final paragraph in my in, in untypical is basically saying you know this book is is a starting point you know this is not the be all and end all you've got to if you've read this fantastic i'm very happy but now put it down and go and get some other information you know because I'm not the arbiter of everything that is autistic. You know, I'm a, I'm a cis white bloke. You know, my experience is limited. <laughs> I haven't got very much, what you know, intersectionality. So go out there and find out what experiences are like for women, for, for people of colour, for people who are non-speaking, for, for people who have also got learning disabilities. You know, get that other information, you know, because there's a lot more out there than just one guy, you know, writing a couple of books. Um, so, so, yeah, get out there immerse yourself find people there are plenty of us out there you know and and we're all desperately trying to share what we know with the world and sadly you know i mean i'm lucky people listen to me for whatever reason a lot of people aren't listening to you know and and we need that to improve yeah absolutely where can where can people go to listen to you what are your social channels <laughs> um well on twitter i'm um at com aficionado for legacy reasons <laughs> so so you can find me you know just look me up on twitter you'll find me easily uh, i've got an instagram where i mostly post pictures of lego if you're into that kind of thing um and facebook as well because you've kind of got to have a facebook um, but i've also got a youtube channel which i try to keep updated uh, and that's where you can find things like this you know videos of me sitting here chatting about autistic stuff you know um i, I do videos on various aspects of autism so burnout meltdowns um communication you know sensory stuff you know so that, that might be useful you know if you if you can if, you, if you're interested in that kind of thing yeah absolutely well like i can't recommend pete's books enough um, and all of his resources um and i'm just so grateful for you today pete for coming on and being so open and helpful in in this ongoing journey that we all have to learn more about autism and neurodiversity so thank you so much for your time today pete no, thank it. you for having me it's always it's always nice to have a chance <laughs> lovely to have you on the show um, so yeah, so that's it for today. Um, I really hope you've enjoyed today's conversation. I really hope that it's benefited, it's benefited you and you've learned something along the way. Um, if there's anything, if there's anyone that you feel could learn more from this conversation, then please do share it on. Um, and also let us know what you think using the hashtag GoodJourneysPod. All past episodes of the show are available now via our website, which is secondmountaincoms.co.uk forward slash podcast. And we're on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Amazon Music, anywhere else that you turn to for podcast fun. So that's it for another episode. Thank you so much for joining Pete and I today. This has been the Good Journeys with Second Mountain podcast. So until next time, let's keep climbing together and I'll see you all again soon.